I had the opportunity to meet Jim um, a few years ago when one of our mutual friends, Neil Billet from Neil Billet Photography, um, organised for Jim to come and do a photo shoot to promote um, Millicent Elizabeth, which is one of the designers that she designed all those beautiful clothes. Um, and he was so gracious to come and bring his, now let's get confused, the boomerang or the chipmunk, is it Jim? That's the boomerang, because the chipmunk wasn't available at the time. <laughs> um, and yeah, we had a wonderful day. Um, Jim has many accolades. As I'm reading through his CV, I'm thinking, how am I supposed to cover this in one to two minutes? Um, you may have seen him recently in the paper as I'm opening it up in the middle spread. That was the first I saw that Jim was actually going to be taking on the chief entrepreneur role. Um, can we say headhunted by Stephen? <laughs> it's sort of read that way. Um, and well deserving. So there's been accolades, I believe he's been involved in the Repat Foundation previously, many, many things, um, and just as a really genuine down to earth guy. So as the founder and um, CEO of Nova Systems, with a defence background, a love for restoring um, planes and history, um, community minded, he was just recently at, um, and very involved, going backwards and forwards, getting all the planes I hear from when they had the Jamestown Air show. Um, the talk today I'm sure you'll find extremely interesting. So I'd like to welcome Jim. Thank you. Is, it, is, that, is that better? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start, I'm going to use a little speaker's prerogative here, and I was going to talk about aircraft restoration, but that involves a lot of bolts and pictures of aircraft structures and stuff. I thought it's better to have a, have a, a brief about, um, about different aeroplanes I've flown instead, and uh, uh, some, of, some of the stories associated with them. Um, I'm also going to talk about entrepreneurship um, briefly as well, and uh, those are two things that are very, very tenuously linked. Um, so I'll, I'll try to draw some, some threads between them, but worst case is I'm just going to switch from aeroplanes to entrepreneurship and we'll see how we go. Um, so I've, I've titled the brief uh, Cockpit to Corporate. Uh, that is me on the left as a very young and good-looking uh, test pilot school student in uh, 1995. Um, you can see I haven't aged too much. Uh, the, the chap on the, the right-hand side, Dave Best, was my tutor then and actually uh, runs one of my companies in the UK now. And the really disappointing thing is he looks exactly the same. <laughs> okay. So, a little bit of uh, history. I'm going to have a, the story so far. Um, this all started, I'm going to see if I've got a little laser pointer on here. I don't know whether I have or not. Um, okay, I'll just point. So, this is my father here, who um, uh, was a World War II fighter pilot, and he's actually sitting in, uh, sitting in front of, or standing in front of a, uh, a CAC boomerang aircraft. I'm going to tell the story about the boomerang a little bit later on, but uh, I guess my connection with aviation um, started through Dad. Um, he died when I was nine years old, but um, I kept that sort of uh, uh, fire burning. And, and from a very early age, from about the age of five, all I ever really wanted to do was uh, was be an Air Force pilot. And um, I, I managed to slip through the cracks and uh, got to fly. Dad had flown uh, several aircraft during the war. This is up in Townsville at Mount Stewart. Uh, here he is going here, uh, a bit, bit later in the war. Uh, and uh, here he is flying a P-40 Kitty Hawk with uh, number 84 squadron again. He was operating out of uh, Townsville and Ross River, flying up into, uh, sorry, uh, Townsville, Ross River, and then up into Horn Island, right in the uh, nor most northern part of Australia, flying uh, into New Guinea. So um, that's probably uh, the start of the inspiration. Um, I, I thought I'd just go through a few of the different aircraft I've flown, and I, I've, been, I've had the great privilege to fly probably about 60 or 70 aircraft um, and have qualifications, captain qualifications on about 40 or 50. Um, the nice thing is I've gone from everything, you know, 1930s Tiger Moths up in the left-hand corner 
to uh, you know F-18s, but you know Alpha jets in Germany, old Douglas DC-3s at uh, the RAF base at Edinburgh, um, Chinese Nanchang aircraft. So um, I've had the good fortune to uh, to fly a, a variety of things. Um, the, the Tiger Moth in particular is, you know, for those of you that, that know it, classic 1930s uh, trainer that basically most pilot pilots, or most pilots, uh, Allied pilots during the Second World War got to learn to fly on. Um, you know, canvas and wood, um, sort of aircraft that's reasonably easy to fly. It's not easy to fly well. Um, and I've had the good, the good privilege to do test flights on several new build ones. Um, for those of you that are, I noticed you've got a flyer about Gilwa, that, that photo's taken down on Hindmarsh Island where a guy, Barry Hills, do, does some really, really beautiful work on Tiger Moths. I'm going to flick through a few of these. Um, uh, these are some of the other aircraft uh, I've flown. I did a bit of work. I wasn't a helicopter pilot in the Air Force, but one of the jobs I had was converting the F-18 over to night vision goggle capability. And the only way I could learn to fly on night vision goggles was to, uh, to fly in some of the, uh, the helicopters in, in the Defence Force that were already fitted with them. So um, flew the Iroquois and the Blackhawk. And, and by the end of about um, you know, a couple of years of doing this pretty regularly, I sort of decided I'd better learn to fly a helicopter as well. And I've, I've subsequently um, ended up with commercial helicopter licences in both Australia, the UK and the US. Um, the BH-18 up in the right hand corner, uh, classic old aircraft, 1930s, uh, lots of movie stars flew around in them. Uh, I flew that for several years. That was uh, really, really uh, great front, fun and a, an absolutely classic aircraft. The Oster down on the left you know, was a World War II generation aircraft, again covered in fabric and um, very, very slow. Uh, looks easy but it's pretty challenging to land and you've got to keep your wits about you. And then the, uh, the Hawk, which we fly in Australia, but I did uh, quite a bit of Hawk flying when I was on test pilot school at the, uh, the still quaintly named Empire Test Pilot School. Uh, that's me flying a gazelle down on the Kurong. I, um, I've, I've got the good fortune to own a couple of gazelle helicopters, which we use for some defence trials in my, in my company. Um, that, that aircraft was built in 1975 and uh, actually flew in the Falklands War and uh, in Bosnia and crashed in Hong Kong Harbour and uh, was pulled out and rebuilt. And I, um, I won't go into the whole story now, but I found it in Uganda about two, two years ago. Um, it had ended up uh, there via slightly nefarious uh, means and was being used for inappropriate things with the British government because it was ex-British Army had decided were totally inappropriate and the company that had them and were using them in the south of Sudan um, uh, basically told them uh, stop what you're doing and uh, or you're never going to get another contract from the, the British Ministry of Defence again. So they ended up parked in a hangar and someone told me about them and I managed to put them into a couple of 40 foot containers and get them back to Adelaide and uh, now flying. Um, I was dealing with some interesting people when I was getting them out of Uganda but uh, more over more at some later stage. Uh, Caribou, when I, when I graduated off pilot's course, I got to fly the, the Caribou, which was a, an old uh, you know, Vietnam era transport aircraft, a couple of big radial engines. Um, uh, fantastic fun to fly, uh, carried about 30 people and uh, could land at sort of less than 100 kilometres an hour on bush strips all over, so um, that was a great experience for me. But it was slow and I did have the need for speed. Um, these are some of the aircraft I've had the privilege to fly, just some civilian aircraft mainly. The CT-4 I flew when I was uh, on basic pilot's course with the Air Force, again great fun but very much like a, a Cessna or something like that. Um, not high performance but you know, taught me the skills I needed. Um, the de Havilland Chipmunk, uh, which is a 1950s British military trainer, again that most uh, pilots in the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy probably uh, learned to fly one. This is uh, flying over Ayers Rock. I, I flew around Australia in it um, several years ago, which um, when you're travelling at 90 knots or about 160 kilometres an hour is, uh, is slow work and uh, it's even worse when you get a headwind and you're tracking down a freeway and the cars are passing you. <laughs> um, you can't quite see it but at the time uh, my five year old son was in the back seat there, you can just see his, his head popping up as well. So uh, he. Uh, uh, we were doing it. We did a documentary on the whole thing, and um, that was one of the shots taken from the camera aircraft. But um, I've still got that aircraft, another chipmunk. Uh, it's a, one of the most beautiful handling aircraft that uh, I've ever flown. And um, one of the guests here, Mike Aitchison, who's a good friend of mine, flies with me. Mike, put your hand up. Also owns a chipmunk as well, and uh, we fly regularly together. 
Uh, F-16 Fighting Falcon, uh, when I was on test pilot school, I went over to the US Air Force test pilot school at, uh, at Edwards Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert, and my, my thesis was on the F-16. Great aeroplane. Wasn't as good as the F-18, but uh, a lot of fun to fly, and uh, you know, for its generation of aircraft, one of the, uh, the mainstays of air forces all over the world. Um, the thing that was unique about the F-16 was first aircraft, little side stick controller, um, very reclined seating position, um, and a uh, little rocket ship uh, no, known as the Viper Jet, but uh, great fun. The uh, great thing about doing test pilot school is you get to fly on everything from fast jets to uh, heavy transport aircraft, and literally in a day you could be in a Jaguar in the morning and flying uh, something like this in the afternoon. Um, I flew the, the Andover, which wasn't that dissimilar to flying the Caribou, which I'd done for two years in the Air Force before I went off to fly F-18s. Um, but what was really interesting was uh, uh, my third flight, so you literally would do two flights in something like the BAC-111, and then you would be sent off by yourself with uh, one of the other students. And uh, on my first solo, uh, I had a French test pilot, or French uh, student who was on his second flight, and there was this poor flight engineer who was there to stop us touching anything or doing anything too bad. And um, uh, we went careering around uh, the southern UK, and uh, it was interesting, because the French guy had real trouble understanding my Australian accent, and the air traffic controllers had real trouble understanding the French guy who was meant to be doing all the uh, air traffic control. Um, we did finally make it back in one piece. Um, for those of you that are into old jets, this was a, a, it's an aircraft called the, the Hunter, um, old classic 1950s fighter. Um, uh, it, the first time I, I got to, uh, I saw this, I was walking down the flight line at Boscombe Down and there was a god almighty bang, literally a, uh, you know, like an explosion. And the starting system on this basically used a couple of shotgun cartridges without the pellets. So you would literally hit this button and there would this, be this god almighty bang and uh, blast of smoke and the engine would start to wind up. And the other great part about the engine on this was that um, on a modern uh, aircraft we do engine RPM in percent. So it's 100% of um, full RPM. But for those of you that know anything about turbine engines, depending on the engine, they'll, they'll operate at anything from sort of 35,000 to 50,000 RPM. And this thing actually had it all manually. It had this dial, and it just went round and round and round and round until it got to about 40,000 RPM, which was sort of slightly hypnotic when you were starting it. Uh, the Jaguar um, looks good, but the most, one of the most appalling aircraft I've ever flown. It, um, it's a 20-engine aeroplane. It's the only twin-engine aeroplane I know of that if you had an engine, so, so by having twin engines, normally if one engine fails, you can usually quite happily keep flying. The problem with the Jaguar is the only aircraft, twin engine aircraft I know, that if you had an engine failure in the landing pattern, it was a mandatory ejection because you were so slow that you would just not recover at uh, anything below a thousand feet. So um, it was actually designed initially as a trainer aircraft for, for students. And I think they decided after they killed the first 15 students that maybe they should um, use something a bit, little bit easier to fly. Um, good looking aeroplane, horrible to fly. You also had to turn the air conditioning off before you took off or if you'd run out of runway. Sort of like driving a, the equivalent of a Daihatsu charade going up a hill. Um, the tornado, some of you will know, I managed to do a fair bit of time in the tornado as well, which was good fun, swing wing uh, jet. I'm going to flick through these quickly because I've got to talk about entrepreneurship in a second. I'm still thinking of the, I'm still thinking of the tenuous link I'm going to find between all these aeroplanes and entrepreneurship. Um, Takano, piston engine aeroplane. Harrier, which was good fun, you know, take off and land vertical. That was all pretty cool. Um, a friend of mine was a Harrier pilot. He took me flying and it. it was great for air shows. It wasn't very good for air combat, so I was glad I flew F-18s. If I'd ever had to go to war. Um, not sure I would have wanted to go in these, but they, they are a very, very impressive aircraft for what they do. Um, I've also managed to do a bit of test flying in a lot of experimental aircraft. This is a two-thirds uh, size P-40 Kitty Hawk. You, you, you might have noticed in the, the first couple of photos of my father, one of the aircraft he was flying was a, a P-40. This is a two-thirds scale size that uh, someone had home built, and uh, I was given the enviable task of taking up on its first test flight, which was great fun. Uh, Mackie, advanced training. I learned to be a fighter pilot on the Mackie and did my advanced training there. That was all good. Put bombs and guns on and uh, learned to uh, 
drop things and shoot guns and things. Uh, old World War II Mustang, again, which you saw the picture of with my father, um, managed to do a bit of time um, in this aircraft. And this aircraft was also open, open, owned by uh, Mike Aitchison over there at that table. Um, I think this photo was taken before you had had it, Mike, but um, managed to do quite a few hours in that. PC-9 flown by the Roulettes. Um, I finally had to leave the, the Air Force Reserve about four years ago because I was about to get more time in the PC-9 than in the F-18. And I just thought, you know, because I'm a fighter pilot, if, uh, I'm, I've, I've got to have an ego. And I just thought, if people ask me, what's the aeroplane you've done the most time in, and I have to say a PC-9, it's, it's going to be too embarrassing for me. So <laughs> I finally quit the Air Force. But it was good fun to fly, and um, I spent lots of time training future test pilots and selecting them for their future careers, which was... Uh, I had the best of both worlds after I left the Air Force in 2000. Um, uh, kept flying with the reserve and so got to wear a suit sort of four days a week and then wear a flying suit the other day, which is great fun. Uh, that's a little S211, Singaporean S211, which I still fly. And for those of you that made it to the Jamestown Air Show, I was flying that, displaying that last or well, Sunday week ago. Um, I, I still get to put on a flying suit and do some defence trials. So um, several weeks ago, I was over in Streaky Bay pretending I was a harpoon anti-ship missile. Um, doing sort of uh, 600 to 700 kilometres an hour at 50 feet above the water. So I still get to have some fun. Um, cute little things like the pits. Uh, this was fun. The first time I did a test flight on this, I turned up and the guy uh, didn't have any headsets or anything like that or, you know, a proper helmet. And it's obviously exposed, so there's a lot of air coming through. And uh, he said, oh, I've only got a normal headset, which would have been blown off in the uh, breeze. And I said, oh, I'm not quite sure what we're going to do. And then um, one of the engineers who'd been working on it turned up with a roll of 100 mile an hour tape, gaffer tape, put the headset on and wrapped it around my head. <laughs> and off I went. I have got a photo. I'll have to find that photo. It's, uh, it's quite comical. Um, that thing looks cute, but it's one of the scariest aeroplanes I've ever flown. Uh, helicopters, learned to fly on those. Went flying in Norway, of all places, which was good fun in weird Norwegian aircraft. That's not me restarting the engine there, but um, managed to fly, fly a Piper Cub. Um, the S211 again. Uh, this is a little high-speed thing called a spring engine, an SX300, which is a home-built. There's some great technology in home-built aircraft. This thing will basically go to um, Cairns in one, or Townsville in one go from Adelaide. Um, in about four and a half hours uh, on the same sort of fuel flow as a, as a four-wheel drive, but it's doing about um, uh, 550 kilometres an hour. So um, there's some, some great technology still in aviation today, little rocket ship. I'm half thinking I might fly that from London to Australia in the next year or so, just for fun. Uh, there it is again. I've cunningly put an F-18 in the background, and that actually is at Townsville, after I landed at Townsville. Uh, T-38s with uh, the US Air Force uh, down at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, again, they, they train the, the shuttle pilots, and a, a good friend of mine, uh, Pam Melroy, who actually works in our company there, um, uh, is the second woman command of Space Shuttle. They learn how to do shuttle landings um, on the T-38 uh, at Edwards on the, uh, on the, the, the Salt Lakes, uh, which is um, interesting, uh, interesting approach. Old T6 Harvard. This was the bad part. I had to, I got to be the German during an air show several years ago, which meant I had to fly around in circles and get shot. As a fighter pilot, that was very humiliating. Um, Hornet, uh, love of my life. Uh, I've got over a thousand hours on F-18. One of the uh, just a really really beautiful aeroplane, and uh, I I flew that up at 75 Squadron uh, up in the Northern Territory uh, out of Tyndall. And uh, that's it when I sort of spend a lot of my time at RG out at uh, the RAF base at Edinburgh as a test pilot. Love that aeroplane. And um, I now have, I, I'm also, one of my other roles is I'm patron of the South Australian Aviation Museum. I'm trying to make sure I get that aeroplane back in the museum when they retire them. I at least can sit in it and reminisce. Um, nice close up on my head. People say I look a lot like Tom, Tom Cruise. Um, <laughs> But particularly when I put the visor down as well. Um, the boomerang, so you saw the photo of uh, my father's boomerang, so um, great story about the boomerang, and this will be my tenuous link to uh, entrepreneurship and technology. So um, many of you may not recognise this aircraft, but basically December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbour, 
And Australia at the time had no fighter aircraft. We had uh, we were away training aircraft, which were totally ill-equipped to, uh, to face any sort of um, modern fighter. And uh, the government at the time went to the... Uh, we had P-40 Kitty Hawks on order from the Americans at the time. The Americans cancelled the order for, you know, you can understand why. Um, but the government went to the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation based at Fisherman's Bend in Melbourne and said, you know, we are desperate. The Japanese are now coming down the Malay Peninsula um, and into New, subsequently into New Guinea and uh, we need fighter aircraft. And they said, can you do something? And they said, oh, we don't know. And they said, well, think about it. So they met in January 1942, four weeks later, and uh, the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation said, look, we think we can do it, and they said, go ahead. Um, so uh, the aircraft flew in May of 1942. So from build a fighter to first flight was less than five months. Now, if you're a student of industrial history, you know, we were a, you know, this little nation of probably, um, I think six to eight million, somewhere in between there, we are a colonial outpost. There were probably um, less than um, seven or eight nations in the world that could have designed and built a fighter. And in that time, it was the same as building a space shuttle or a um, you know, satellite or something like that. And as Australia, we did it. You know, we, we had the capability to do really, really magnificent things and do it in very, very short time when the pressure was on. It wasn't the greatest fighter in the world, um, but it was an example of what Australians can do with a little bit of a can-do attitude. You know, we were the fourth nation in the world to put a satellite into orbit, um, and we once had really, really great technical capability. Um, so this is my tenuous link to uh, entrepreneurship, because um, that story of the boomerang is one of the things that inspired me to start and develop my company, Nova Systems, which um, I left the Air Force in, uh, in 2000. Um, uh, basically, I met an Adelaide girl who had three kids from her previous marriage, and so that ruined my Air Force career. And uh, I, I'd lost first wife to the Air Force. I thought it'd be careless to lose a second. Um, uh, and I'd, I'd done an MBA at the University of Adelaide, which I thought would be useful when I was the chief of the Air Force. Uh, and um, uh, subsequently, um, when Melinda and I decided that we'd get married, um, we've now got six kids, um, but uh, subsequently uh, decided to get married, I went to uh, one of my entrepreneurship lecturers and I said, uh, hey, I've done pretty well on the MBA, you know, group, uh, Dean's List of Outstanding Graduates. Um, you know, I'm a fighter pot, all around good light, good guy, um, charming, witty, good looking, uh, honest, <laughs> modest, self-effacing, all those things. Um, and I said, uh, which company in Adelaide is going to have the great good fortune to employ me? And uh, he turned around to me and said, no one. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, all you can do is drop bombs and shoot aeroplanes out of the sky. No one's going to give you a job. And uh, so that sort of burst my bubble for about two seconds. Um, and uh, he said to me, what happened to that business plan you wrote for the entrepreneurship course? And when I was doing the entrepreneurship course at the University of Adelaide, I'd, uh, we'd done a, a group assignment and for the final assignment we had to come up with a business plan and I, I used to turn up in a flying suit to because uh, I was doing it part time. And I remember turning up to uh, one of the entrepreneurship lectures for the final assignment he said, I want you to do this and I went up to him and I said, oh professor, look, I'm, you, know, you can tell I'm a fighter pot, I'm actually not really interested in entrepreneurship and I don't know how to spell it, I'm only here because my friends are here. Um, and uh, he said, uh, I said, you know, can't you just give me another Harvard Business School case study? And he said, uh, uh, no, look, I want you to go and think of something. Anyway, um, I said, oh, OK, I'll think about it. So I came back a week later for the lecture a week later, and uh, he, said, uh, he said, have you thought of something? I said, oh, no, look, I'm, I'm, I've thought about it hard, but I'm just not really interested in this stuff, and uh, it'd be better if you just give me another Harvard case study. He turned around to me and he said, Jim, this is an entrepreneurship course. Think of something or fail. It's like, oh, OK. <laughs> Clearly, I wasn't very bright. Um, anyway, I subsequently came up with a, uh, a business idea for a, a defence engineering independent services company. And uh, park, you know, I did reasonably well, parked it on my shelf. And, um, and the result of all that was that when I was having lunch several, you know, a year or so later, he said to me, what happened to that business plan you wrote? And I said, uh, what business plan? He said, oh, your final assignment. And I said, oh, I don't know, it's on my bookshelf. He said, was it true? And I said, yeah. And uh, he said, well, why don't you start that company? So hence, um, my organisation, Nova Systems, was formed. And uh, despite the incompetence of senior management, which Mike will attest to, it's done not too badly. So we now operate uh, uh, all over the world. We've got about 600 people, mostly masters and PhD qualified engineers. 
And I hope we are a great example of what Australian technology companies can do um, and that we can compete on a global stage. So we do aerospace, defence, a lot of space-related work, oil and, oil and gas, um, transport. So I've got about two minutes um, before Laurel's going to wind me up. Uh, so I'll talk very quickly uh, about my role as Chief Entrepreneur. So the Premier um, got me at a weak moment at my home at about 11.30 at night after several glasses of wine and said, uh, Jim, I've got a great idea. I'm going to create an office of the Chief Entrepreneur and there's going to be a Chief Entrepreneur. And I said, oh, Stephen, that's a good idea. Who's going to do that? And he turned around to me and he said, you. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, OK. Um, oh, sorry, what's happening? No, I could keep going. Um, I, said, uh, I said, how many people have you asked before? And he said, oh, don't worry, it's less than a dozen. Um, I said, OK. And I said, how much am I going to get paid? He said, nothing. I said, how many days is it going to be? He said, oh, it won't be more than a day or two a week. So far, it's been about five days a week. Um, and so here I am. But the, the, the role of the Office of the Chief Entrepreneur is literally to, uh, to increase entrepreneurship in the state. I've got a great team uh, down on the right-hand side. Um, I won't um, bore you with all our identities, but um, the people down on the bottom right-hand side are far more entrepreneurial than me. Um, and uh, what we are trying to do is just um, lift the awareness of entrepreneurship, encourage everyone from young kids uh, to university graduates to retirees to think about starting businesses, um, you know, in all sorts of areas. But you know, we really want to focus in particular on defence, digital space, and creative industries. Um, the old Royal Adelaide Hospital site, which is down here. Um, North Terrace is along the bottom and then Frame Street along the, uh, the side um, is being converted into an entrepreneurial hub, uh, now known as Lot 14, which will be the cathedral for entrepreneurship in South Australia and Adelaide, the city of churches, nice analogy, um, and all the other areas like NVI and uh, Tonsley and all those sort of stuff we, ha we hope will be the, the sort of other churches and parishes uh, and be part of a really, really broad entrepreneurial ecosystem to help take the state forward and do some great things for South Australia. And I would implore all of you who have um, friends, relatives, um, uh, kids, all those sorts of things that may be um, thinking about starting their own businesses or anything like that, to encourage them and say, give it a go and to support them. It is really, really hard work and it's really, really lonely work. And I'm sure many of you have started your own businesses and know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but my job and the, the job of the Entrepreneurial Advisory Board is to support them and uh, help us make uh, South Australia regain its rightful place as a, uh, a world leader in business and I hope, in my case, technology. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Wow, I never realised there were so many planes. <laughs> really, really interesting. I really appreciate it. Now what I'd like to do is open up for a few questions. We've just got a few moments. So, um, yes, uh, over. thank you. Sir, so for a state that's reputed to grow by 500,000 people by 2035, and for a state that's built a hospital that's only two-thirds of our existing one, yep. What are your plans as an entrepreneur to do something about the old Royal Adelaide Hospital and damn all as well, rebuild part of it? What, 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 do you, what, what do you got planned there? Well, I've I, I got to say, the, the old uh, RA, unfortunately, I don't think is going to be a precinct for health anymore. Um, uh, I will raise it with the Premier when I see him next, and I, I totally understand your point. Um, I have several... Uh, uh, colleagues in the medical fraternity, and uh, I know it's an acute issue. Um, uh, I don't think it's in my remiss at the moment, but uh, I'll pass it on to Stephen Wade. All right, we have just over there, wherever the mic is. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just wondering that the platform we begin this entrepreneur journey is a defence one. Is there room on the broom for social enterprise for community? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, look, 
Um, the, the, just without going into uh, excessive detail, one of the things that we're planning to do on Lot 14 is going to have a very broad remit in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, both from where people come from. So, you know, we want to go from Cooper PD down to Mount Gambier. We want it to be every, everything from the, um, you know, the ten-year-old kid that's you know selling a computer program to uh, his or her mates to the retiree maybe from you know ASC boilermaker who's decided to sell garden furniture. The concept down there, though, is so all those entrepreneurs we hope will come into those into that space and learn from other entrepreneurs, um, and that will include people uh, who are, have got a, a social uh, entrepreneur agenda, um, and uh, that's an important part of it. Um, it's also an important part, I think, for the people that are you know for-profit entrepreneurs that they see that um, there's a social uh, uh, well-being aspect to to what's going on as well. The, after they get to the 15 to 30 people, uh, if they're in those, those four verticals of defence, digital, space uh, and creative industries, we're hoping we'll keep them on lot 14 and growing their businesses there. But for those others, you know, they'll be moving to places like Tonsley, to Mawson Lakes, you know, to all the other organisations that will be supporting entrepreneurship in the state. So lot 14 is part of it, but it's part of a broader ecosystem and social entrepreneurship is definitely part of the whole agenda. I just have two more questions, one from Tiffany and then there's Jenna Miller at the back. Thank you. Hi, Tiffany Schultz from Conscious Lifestyles. Um, I, I was wondering um, what kind of support specifically that the office is um, planning to provide. You mentioned networking with other entrepreneurs like um, uh, events, I assume, and um, uh, particularly for uh, women and also um, I guess for entrepreneurs to not just start businesses but actually keep them going. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so one of the, the main focus we've got at the moment is to um, uh, get some accelerators in there. So um, there's companies like Fishburners, Stone and Chalk who run the accelerators in uh, you know, Queensland, Sydney and Victoria. We've got an expression of interest process going through at the moment and we are hoping that we will get one of those larger accelerators and incubators to come into Lot 14 um, and to do a lot of that work. So entrepreneurs will be able to go into those, uh, that facility, you know, they will have access and be bringing in sort of capital, so VC, you know, venture capitalists, private equity, angel investors, all those sorts of things. There'll be in a network where um, they can talk to other entrepreneurs, where they'll have access to accountants, lawyers, marketing people. Um, uh, I, I met with Maura. Uh, from uh, from Chooks uh, the other day to talk about um, uh, how we get the gender part of it right, and you know one of the things I want to push at the moment is that one percent of state government super goes into early stage uh, startups. Now I don't know how you feel, but if, if if my super fund said to me, do you mind if we put one one percent of your um, your capital uh, into startups that are going to build the state and build jobs and actually potentially make your super a lot more valuable. I would think that's a pretty good idea. And I think there's a role for that, that sort of funding to, um, to be going into social entrepreneurship and also to be going into uh, um, uh, you know, diverse entrepreneurship for, for women and, and other groups as well. And that's part of what we're trying to do. Uh, thanks, Jim, for a, a fantastic presentation for all us aviation tragics out here. Um, but just two questions, I guess, and very quick ones. The place of education and, and how do we get kids into this? Yep. And secondly, you touched on it then, but uh, access to capital. Most of the organisations that are funders are national. How do you get a profile in that? So there's a couple of things. Um, you know, we're, we're talking to the schools, and there are actually going to be a couple of uh, high schools that are, that are going to be identified and going to have entrepreneurship courses. And, you know, I talked about the the 10 year old boy or girl that's got a computer program, you know, they're micro entrepreneurs, they're not maybe going into the workforce or starting their companies right now. But we want to identify those young kids that have got a little bit of business spirit um, about them um, and a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit about them and maybe say to their parents, hey, you should think about them going to the school because this is going to be you know, one of those schools where we're teaching business skills and we're teaching entrepreneurial skills and bits and pieces like that. So um, it's got to, it, it is actually really important that it starts early. Like it's got to start in primary school. Uh, and that's a, a big, big, um, big part of the brief. Sorry, second question, Steve. Funding. funding, yeah. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. So um, you know, we are talking to a lot of the private equity firms and venture capital firms. There is now the South Australian venture capital firm of uh, uh, South Australia Cap venture capital um, uh, firm that's uh, 
done, already uh, put a lot of money into Mariota, which is down on lot 14, which is doing um, Internet of Things and small sat, sorry, South Australian Venture Capital Fund. Um, we are working on bringing money in. You know, again, there's some big family offices in Adelaide. Most of that money tends to go into reasonably conservative infrastructure and things like that. We do need to get some angel funds and some private equity down here, um, get some of those family offices and some of that capital, and as I say, potentially super into those funds um, to provide uh, early stage uh, capital. Um, and that's a big focus of what we're trying to do as well. Right, well, I'd like to say thank you, Jim, for your time today, and I'm sure it's going to be a watch this space with all of us eager watching what's happening in relation to this space. I'd like you just to present you with just a little gift to say thank you and thank you very much. And um, just...